and welcome to this video lesson which is focusing on the poem by Caroline Duffy called Before You Were Mine and it features on the AQA Love and Relationships Anthology. Okay, as with all the uh, poems you'll be used to by now, I'll give a bit of background information, I'll pick out the key areas, observations on form, language and structure which are the three areas that you need to focus on for the exam and then I'll do a line by line analysis of the poem. Okay, so a bit of context. Uh, Caroline Duffy frequently writes about gender, oppression and violence. However, this poem is an autobiographical one about her mother. It moves before, between the past, the 1950s and the present. It was published in 1993. And what's it about? Well, uh, briefly, it's about the poet's memories of her mother's life before and after she was born. It is told from the viewpoint of the poet who is omniscient. That means she's present even though she can't remember the past because she wasn't born 10 years before she was born, um, she kind of uses the stimulus of a photograph um, to imagine what her mother's life must have been like. Um, she addresses her mother directly and, carries a, and, and the poem carries a poignant tone, like reflective, sad and a bit nostalgic tone. The title is an inversion of how we usually view the parent-child relationship before you were mine. You'd, um, it, like that kind of ownership and possession. In this instance, it is the child expressing expressing ownership of the mother, which may hint at the guilt the daughter feels that the mother's life hasn't turned out as good as it could have done had she not given birth to her. Um, and the themes covered briefly are the past, memory, family, time, admiration and longing. So method and meaning, I'll say this quite a lot, and um, the examiners are looking for you to explore method and meaning to get top grades. Method are poetic devices and techniques used, and that's great to identify them, but it's not enough to simply uh, identify them. You must explore um, the meaning, the uh, draw inferences from um, particular techniques that the poets have used. Um, so I'll, I'll explain what that, or I'll show you what that means. So the form, the poem is made up of four equal five line stanzas. There's your method, which could reflect the steady passage of time and the inevitability of changing relationships. So there's your meaning. It is written in blank verse, which is your method, which could reflect the underlying disharmony. So, or kind of the negative relationship, the negative aspects of the relationship. There's your meaning. This fragmented and imagined, oh, sorry, the fragmented and imagined memories are reflected in the mix of enjoyment and sasura the poet uses. So for the last time I'll point it out, um, enjoyment and sasura is the method, um, fragmented and imagined memories. That's, that's the uh, interpretation, that's the meaning, the effect of those techniques or one interpretation of them. The structure, the poem begins and ends with the mother on a pavement, in the opening stanza having fun, whilst in the final stanza being on the wrong one, highlighting how time passing changes things. There is a clear division between the before and after of the poet's arrival. Um, some observations on language and imagery. Exciting language is used throughout, laugh, shriek, fizzy, ballroom, Marilyn, to reveal how glamorous the imagined life of the mother was before the birth of her daughter. This reflects a deep love and admiration for her mother. This is juxtaposed, contrasted, with the possessive language used to portray the daughter, my loud, possessive yell, and how she feels she took her mother's freedom away. There is a sense of sadness here, and the poem's constant flitting between the past and the present reflects how one life has interfered with the other. The direct tone lends an intimacy, but also perhaps an anger, that she has controlled her mother's life too much. Okay, so moving on to... Uh, a more detailed analysis of this poem. Okay, I'm ten years away from the corner you laugh on with your pals, Maggie McGinney and Jean Duff. The three of you bend from the waist, holding each other, or your knees, and shriek at the pavement. Your polka dot dress blows round your legs. Marilyn. So, um, I'm ten years away. So, the first three stanza start with a reminder of the distance in time between the narrator's birth and her mother's youth, fun and freedom. So uh, this is 10 years before the poet uh, was uh, born. And the detail in the first stanza implies that she's looking at a photograph, perhaps. So the present tense is used to describe an event from the past, plus the detail makes the scene more realistic. Perhaps she's looking at a photograph. Um, now, Marilyn, one single word sentence stuck on the end of um, stanza one. 
um, the cesora, you know, cesora is any form of punctuation before the end of a line. So in this case, it's the full stop after legs. And then the end stop, the full stop after Marilyn. This emphasizes the comparison with the glamorous film star. Now, the glamorous film star committed suicide. I think she was about 37 when she did so. I might be wrong on that. Um, but that hints at perhaps at trouble to come. So the future won't be as bright and um, fulfilling as perhaps it could have been. This is from the daughter's perspective now, not from the mother's perspective. I'm not here yet. The thought of me doesn't occur in the ballroom with the thousands, thousand eyes, the fizzy movie tomorrows, the right walk home could bring. I knew you would dance like that. Before you were mine, your ma stands at the close with the hiding for the late one. You reckon it's worth it. So slipping between the tenses now into present, I'm not here yet, present tense. Um, thousand eyes, the fizzy movie tomorrow's optimism and hope she sees in the mother's um, face um, from 10 years before she was born. Lots of sesora here, emphasising certain aspects. So, for example, the repetition of the title, Before You Were Mine. Your ma stands at the close with the hiding for the late one. You reckon it's worth it. So the repetition of the title, then here, um, she's a bit sounds a bit rebellious. She was full of fun, but also constrained by her own mother, but reckons the trouble it caused was worth it. So that implies a rebellious streak. And you, there's a hint, hint of jealousy seeping into the poem from the, the, the poet's perspective towards her mother. Um, jealous of what? Jealous of um, the type of person her mother was, perhaps. Jealous, perhaps, that she never saw that side of her mother. Let's see what what the next, the final two stanzas um, reveal. Okay, um, right. The decade ahead of my loud possessive yell was the best one, eh? I, re I remember my hands in those high-heeled red shoes, relics, and now your ghost chatters to clatters towards me over George Square till I see you, clear as scent under the tree with its lights, and whose small bites on your neck, sweetheart. Cha-cha-cha, you'd teach me the steps on the way home from Mass, stamping stars from the wrong pavement. Even then I wanted the bold girl winking in Portobello, somewhere in Scotland, before I was born. That glamorous love lasts where you sparkle and waltz and laugh before you are mine. OK, my loud possessive yell, possessive pronoun, conversational style, rhetorical question, all contained within this opening line of stanza three. Points all point towards the narrator as a demanding baby who ended her mother's freedom and fun. And she carries a guilt and responsibility for that, even though she was a baby, you know, there was no intention there. Um, I've highlighted in blue relics and ghosts. So relics are precious artefacts from the past, but they're in the past and won't return. Now her mother is a shadow of what she was, a ghost of what she was. Her clear ascent and cha-cha-cha, these are sound techniques, appeal to the senses that makes the memory more vivid. And who's small bites on your neck, sweetheart? So normally you'd have a parent saying to a child, um, maybe a teenage daughter or son coming home with little love bites on their neck, and you're like, oh, where'd you get that from? But here it's the other way around. It's, it's the daughter um, saying this to her mother, obviously maybe looking at this photograph. So... Although it's um, kind of present, it's, it's about a, a, a past um, imagined memory. Um, I wanted the bold winking girl in Portobello. So this is impossible envy. This is where I was in, uh, suggesting in the previous stanza that, uh, or the earlier screen that um, there was a jealous a type of jealousy, a hint of jealousy. Envy possibly would be fairer description. Um, she wanted to know her mother when her mother was at her best. Um, and she believes she's not seen that. Uh, Sasora highlights how her birth ended mother's freedom. That glamorous love lasts where you sparkle and waltz and laugh before you were mine. Repeating the title and ending with mine adds to this, the possessive tone of the poem, emphasising the difference between now and then. Um, Stamping stars from the wrong pavement, just a little comment on that. Um, you've got sibilant sound there drawing attention to that, but the wrong pavement. Um, the first stanza starts with her um, on, on, the, on, the, on the pavement, having fun with her, her friends. Now she's with her daughter, 
she's on the wrong pavement, so maybe a, a different path, not the path that she set out on initially, or that she thought she would be on, but the wrong pavement. Now, there's no hint from the mother's perspective that she's um, in, other, in, in any way bothered by the arrival of her daughter. This comes from the daughter's perspective. Okay, so that's a, an analysis of Before You Were Mine. Um, there's plenty there to um, use to compare to um, another poem on the anthology in the exam. Uh, just a brief summary then of the poetic devices used, and you should use these in, in your comparative, comparative analysis. Autobiographical, cyclical nature, exciting language, blank verse, enjoyment, sasura, possessive language, conversational tone, direct tone. Useful vocab to use when analysing this poem. I mean, I'm sure you've got plenty of useful vocab yourselves, but in case you're stuck, here's some here's some um, language you could use in your analysis to make it more sophisticated and analytical. Reflective, possessive, poignant, admiration, nostalgia, guilt, sadness, self-criticism, fragments, omniscient, disharmony. And links to other poems, which is the key uh, part of the question. Um, the evolving parent-child relationship in Follower and Walking Away, or childhood memories in Eden Rock, perhaps. Or if your teacher suggests other comparisons or you come up with some yourself, then uh, uh, equally valid, I'm sure. OK, hope you found that useful, and um, see you back for all the other videos. Bye-bye.